occasionally to support him for being a sponsor. Oh, he's a, what he does. You've got a little clear eye view sponsorship. These are not clear eye view, so I probably shouldn't put these on. But the blue light technology is huge, guys. There you it's go. Huge. Absolutely. Right. But you know, the, the one thing, the one thing I like about you is like you're able to do that. You're able to do the have a clear eye view, regardless if you have the glasses on or not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I do segue. Yeah, and I'm gonna tell you something. Like a lot of people have asked me, like you know, why I have like a high admiration for yourself, and the reason why I why we do here is because being independent we understand about kind of like not necessarily saying we don't have a voice but our voice not getting heard you know what i'm saying so in a, in a lot of times we think like the underground you know the underground you know people who are like more who want to know those real facts and when you're out there and you're looking for honest reporting you're always consistent with your questions and i and i always tell myself if i had this moment to be in front of jerry jones what kind of question would i ask and like about asked. Dak prescott and then you ask it <laughs> and then you ask it and you've done it, and you've done it, and you've done it so consistently that um you know i was just you know i was definitely eager to get you on the show and kind of um kind of go over some questions and things i know time is of the essence so we're going oh, to so if you don't mind we're going to jump right into this thing if yeah. you don't let's jump right into it so kind of to start just kind of start this thing off we've you know we you had a really good um outside of the technical issues you had a really good question i kind of doubled down as far as when you were talking to Mike McCarthy about um, the participation of, of Dak Prescott, and you know, I don't, you know, I you know, I hate assuming, but I, I feel like a question that easy could have been sufficed with a yes or no answer, but for whatever reason they replaced it with other things. So, you being, um, I just want your honest opinion. You know, you know, what do you what do you think is going on, and why has it taken two years for Dak Prescott to get to today where he's still waiting on a, a contract? So a lot to unpack here. Um, so in the presser, Clarence Hill, uh, we had an order of how the reporters were going to ask questions. Uh, in other words, David Moore was first and then Clarence Hill. And then I was kind of low on the list. Ed Warder was after me, so that's good. Uh, I'm kidding, I love Ed. <laughs> um, but Clarence had asked a question we were all working towards. And, and quite frankly, I had reached out to quite a few sources on Monday to confirm whether Dak Prescott was going to be part of OTAs. Why is that a big deal when it's voluntary? Well, it's a big deal when you consider that you have a new coach who really hasn't had a lot of face time with his players and who, while he's trying to keep the terminology as close to what they used and, and still kind of have some of that base of what they were running with Kellen Moore, Scott Linehan, you know, those guys, uh, this is still going to be a new offense. He's admitted that. Uh, so I, I thought it was an important question given a new coaching staff, the pandemic, uh, the importance of building camaraderie in a Zoom room if you can. I mean, I've noticed even at my own network, there's it's that having that touch point right now has been good. There's, we've had uh, you know positive conversations, uh, and so when Clarence asked it, I don't know if you guys have the audio and you played it back. He's made it sound like Dak was in the virtual chat. <laughs> That's what I said. And so yes. I'm, com <laughs> I'm com to pull the curtain back. I'm composing a tweet. And just to be careful, I reached out uh, the Cowboys PR and I reached out to some reporters in a side text because the way the uh, conference call was today, we couldn't see who was on the call and they couldn't see us. And so if you heard me saying a couple of times, I just, you know, I want to make sure this isn't contentious. When you can't see a person asking you a question and I'm sort of doubling down on you, especially with a new coach that I don't have a, a, a relationship with, I wanted to make it very clear to him. I wasn't trying to, I got you, or I'm trying to make this adversarial. I want to make sure I'm getting it right, especially since you don't know me like that. And I don't want to, I don't want to infer or misinterpret you. So when I went back, all of a sudden, instead of saying that Dak was sort of in this uh, virtual chat, now it's, I'm not giving the roll call uh Dak has been in touch with the coaches and it's voluntary hmm. that sure sounds like again I don't want to infer here so I'll just let you guys read between the lines <laughs> uh but I thought that was interesting now someone had told me oh well within the organization it's really a non-story I get that he doesn't have a contract he's not getting paid to go to voluntary OTAs right now right but it isn't story. And as I reminded this person, if the third string running back breathes, it's a story in Dallas. Yeah. So 
this is your quarterback uh, who had threatened to hold out, which again is not a fair terminology because he's not holding out. Uh, he's simply just withholding his services. And <laughs> this is also uh, on the Cowboys. You know, if you think about it, the Cowboys, interestingly enough, have never really get had the contracts in recent years get to this point where a player is entering his final year and they don't have an extension. But that's the case with Dak. Now, if they had gotten this thing done before Jared Goff or Carson Wentz, they wouldn't be here. Um, but a few things just to marinate on and ruminate that I may not necessarily on the, say on the NFL Network, just some, this is me talking out loud. And again, I don't know these answers. So this is, again, me just talking with fans and, and, and trying to address some of the things you guys are talking about. What if this pandemic affects 16 games this season? What if Mike McCarthy doesn't get these OTAs and gets an abbreviated training camp? Does it behoove the Cowboys then to say, why am I going to pay this quarterback all this money if it's not going to really matter this year? In other words, he's going to sign likely the franchise tag because as I understood it with even Ezekiel Elliott and, and DeMarcus Lawrence and those guys, if they don't sign those franchise tags, whenever they decide to come back, they still have to, to sign the tag, right? They, they hold his exclusive rights this year. So they could just renegotiate with them next year regardless and kind of save themselves a little bit of money this year. Now, that doesn't make a ton of sense when you consider they're still paying him $31 million this year, right? So, but I just wonder, like, now does that affect your leverage, Todd France, just a little bit, given that we don't know what this is going to look like this year? Again, I don't know. I think I'm reaching a little bit there. It's just something that popped in my head today. Um, and I don't know if I'd ever get a straight answer on that, quite frankly. But I do think that this whole thing has gotten interesting in the sense that Todd Frentz has made them feel like they the Cowboys have to do this contract extension. And the Cowboys are sort of going, no, we don't. In fact, we can tag you again next year. So we'll sort of see where this whole thing uh, shakes out. I did get some clarity on... You know, I thought it curious that they released this virtual chat with OU quarterback Jalen Hurts. And I'm like, oh, are, <laughs> are the Cowboys being messy? Uh, I was told, don't read into that too much. Uh, in fact, you know, I had also reported earlier that they had talked to Florida International QB James Morgan, who interestingly enough, his coach, I actually sat down with James and his coach at Conference USA when it was at the Star in Frisco last summer. And that coach is Butch Davis, and as Cowboy fans will remember, he was a defensive coordinator, coordinator. under Jimmy Johnson and wins yeah. the Super Bowl. So there's sort of a nice story there, uh, but it was the Cowboys talking about, and, and specifically McCarthy, the importance of looking at a quarterback in this draft, whether it be in the earlier rounds or the later rounds, I, I don't see them picking one at 17. That would be ridiculous. Uh, it is because if you look at the template in Green Bay since 1992, they only had two starting quarterbacks, Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. All the quarterbacks that they brought in were young players that they developed and used as draft value, a commodity the Cowboys have been absolutely terrible at. In fact, I went to our research department and said, when's the last time the Cowboys used a quarterback as a tradable commodity? Can you guys guess when that was? As a um... Very few will know this. Ooh. It wasn't Quincy because we let him go. A draft I mean, commodity. Mm -mm. Uh, that would probably be with Aikman and um, the Miami quarterback. You're getting close. So mm -hmm. the year they took Troy Aikman, uh, they picked up Steve Walsh in the supple Steve as Walsh, one of their supplemental guys. Oh, yeah. Good job. And so Steve ah. Walsh got traded to the Saints in 1990. Good job, boss. They picked up a first and third pick. Uh, for the 91 draft, and then they got a second round pick in the 1992 draft. But that is an example, which I think they ended up picking up Quincy Carter with one of those picks, which is kind of funny. Uh, oh. mm. They actually haven't picked a quarterback in the first three rounds since Quincy Carter. Another fun fact uh, that I reported the other day. But I, I think some people were reading into the fact, oh, they're looking at quarterbacks. They're clearly tired of Dak or they're looking for a Dak, an heir apparent kind of look at this more of like a Jimmy G situation, you know, look at how, what a commodity yeah. Jimmy was for Belichick. And I'm sure they wish they had hung on to him uh, with Tom Brady in the exodus that is today. What crazy news, uh, but just some clarity on that as well. Another takeaway uh, from today's presser was, you know, you talked about why not just answer the question? Why are you guys being so dodgy? This four, three, three, four defense 
Mm -hmm. I had been reporting that they were moving more towards a 3-4 system. He didn't really answer that question, so that was my other, uh, I went back to get clarity. And so I'm sure he was I like, saw what, that is on this your I loved mm -hmm. it. what is this chick's deal? Get off me Slater. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, I thought that was interesting because a lot of people have been questioning Leighton Van Der Esch's health because yes. they've been looking at these linebackers. Uh, I've been able to confirm that they looked at Patrick Queen at LSU. Uh, they really like Kenneth Murray out of OU. And I was told Leighton is fine. Uh, he's been training and working out in Idaho. I mean, in a, uh, yeah, Idaho with Idaho. his wife, uh, Maddie, and he's good to go. This is because Mike Nolan's system, and he at least said this today, which was a slight admission. He said that it's going to be a 4-3 four, three three, four, three defense with a lot of 3-4 principles. Well, I've been told a lot of 3-4 principles. In fact, that's why they went and got Alvin Smith. Uh, at least one other player is confirmed. It's a 3-4 defense. Uh, Chase on. The kid, yeah. Caleb on out of LSU, edge rusher. Of course, Mike Nolan knows him well because he's in his, he's been in his backyard. He's mm -hmm. more of a 4-3 guy. Uh, and then I was also told in this scenario, Leighton Van Der Esch would move to the Mike position and you would see Jalen Smith rushing more. So they're calling it 4-3 with 3-4 principles. Cool. But expect to see a lot of 3-4 stuff is I guess what I'm getting at. My yeah. question, My question to that is, what happens to that guy that he drives a tank to work? He has dreads, wears number 90, likes to put his hand in the dirt. What happens to that guy? Oh, yeah, Jane. Uh, the great question. That extension oh, is going to start it, sometime it, it, this year, I think. So with that where, Coast, where, where kept, does that yeah. land, my guy? Like, I got this big hot boy sticking behind saying, me. <laughs> we, got, we have other guys that can also pressure. <laughs> yeah, but D-Law, D-Law, why D-Law? I'm not speaking for D-Law, but I'm just saying his tape says that he prefers to have his hand in the dirt. Yes. And you paid him. You ground. you paid him a ton of money to put your put his hand in the dirt, which may be why they are being very deliberate and calling it a four three, and maybe they're going to ask of D Law to do other things. I, I don't know. They're they're you know we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, we haven't seen these players. We don't have the we don't have the uh, virtue of seeing these players or, you know, really talking to a ton of them uh, as a reporter. I try to be judicious and and who I go to at what times for information. And I think I realized the challenges of this pandemic for them. Uh, a lot of them are spending more time than they ever have in the off season with their families. Uh, they've got questions about, you know, the league and what the next season's going to look like. And so I'm not trying to bog them down with questions, especially putting players in a weird spot with a new coaching staff, leaking a lot of information right now, if that makes sense. Uh, because I, I don't think you want to start getting into a situation where the coaching staff begins to feel like they can't trust their locker room. That's true. You you brought up the pandemic a, a few times. Just off of what you've seen over the past seasons, if the past seasons are normal, how how has how if on a scale of maybe like a like how normal is this situation not? Are, you know, our teams because I mean you're not able to do like workouts. There's so many different things. Like are are, st are, t are teams still looking at this draft as a normal draft or, or are they kind of like filtering it through the sphere of this might be a little tainted a little bit? I know it nobody wants to say So a few things on that. I'll, I'll address the how teams are viewing this in the draft and then I'm going to come back to just the situation as a whole because I, I don't think people have really wrapped their arms around it and I've I've been hearing some things that I think are fascinating. Uh, talking to coaches, coaches will tell me, look, we typically don't scout college players, period. Uh, we rely heavily on the tape. Mm. And so it's sort of like this underwear Olympics when they show up at the facility and, and do some of these drills. This is forcing them to rely on the tape. Uh, when I talked to the Titans the other day, and I think that this probably even applies, you know, to other teams, it was... John Robinson, the GM, and even Mike Grable, the head coach, who said there were, you know, obviously when you're at the combine, these guys are going through this drill of, you know, 30 interviews a night, right? And so by the time they get to each coach and you're getting them to walk through a, a whiteboard and regurgitating plays back, et cetera, they're, I mean, they're a mess. You know, they've been through the workouts. This year, the, the way they did it was a little different too with the night workouts. They circled back with a few of the guys and those guys in, 
they said seeing them in their home setting, the way you're kind of seeing me in mine. And the, I don't know if it's because when you're not in a room face to face with someone, maybe you can be a little bit more yourself because it doesn't feel like you kind of have to feel the room put on airs. They said that they got more of an authentic feel for some of the guys, seeing them in their settings and their homes. And I've done a lot of prospect interviews even for, I do a podcast for the herd called the boys and girl podcast. And in talking to the players, you know, their mornings have been lined up with the interviews and then they're trying to do body weight exercises in their houses or in this situation with James Morgan, he lives in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, which again is an interesting parallel for, uh, he grew up a huge Packers fan and his brother actually played on an AAU basketball team with Mike McCarthy's son, but he didn't know Mike like that at that time. Um, he got kicked out of a park. The police got called on him just for throwing the ball with his sister who was snapping the ball and his brother who was rushing him and his dad who was catching the ball. So, you know, you saw Tom Brady get kicked out of the park in Tampa. There's been a challenge for these guys just to work out who don't have a home gym or access to a gym right now. So I, the big thing that I keep hearing, not only from players, but from coaches is the importance of their players to be self-motivated, to be self-starters. Uh, I had one coach in the league tell me that he's not even going to do the OTAs. In fact, he's telling his players, no OTAs. This is going to be a lot like the lockout. I'll see you guys at the start of training camp. So wow. I, again, I want you guys to sort of wrap your brains around because I live here in Texas. Um, Governor Abbott has already started opening some stuff up. In other words, the parks are open. Retailers this week are able to start opening. And as long as it's curbside, you can gather in groups of five. And then he is opening it up even more uh, in May. Now, Dallas County is trying to say May 15th, and then we'll revisit. But you're seeing even Georgia is allowing people to go to the bowling alley. And they're allowed to go to the movie theater. And barbershops are opening. I think a lot of people think we're just going to have this return to normal. In other words, oh, you know, the NFL's got this perfect timing. This is typically our off season. We're going to be getting back to business. I'm hearing a very real scenario that whether it be the beginning of the season or at some point in the season, we're going to be playing games without fans. And then what does that look like for reporters? Well, reporters, we might sort of be corned off from everybody and our access to players may be over a Zoom chat or over headphones or kind of think NASCAR, like you could listen into player one or player two in the locker room. This is like conversations that are being had right now. And I think there's a lot of fans are just like, oh, it's going to be business as usual. I'm hearing there are very real contingency plans being addressed because I think if you listen to anyone with the CDC, this thing's coming back in, in uh, the fall. And so I think, again, fans are starting to see like Jacksonville, your beaches are open. And, but if California doesn't allow there to be sporting events or live events, as Governor Newsom has been talking about. 2021. Right. A lot of these teams are going to have to find a neutral site to play. What does that look like? So there are all these discussions that are being had, but I think that the, the sports fan sees the NFL draft coming up and there's talk of PGA beginning. Even the PGA is going to look different. Uh, there's not going to be a gallery. They're talking about uh, Memorial Day weekend here in Fort Worth is going to be their first event, the Colonial. But I, I do think that the, the sports fan is just going, oh, it's going to be back to normal. It's mm -mm. not going to be back to normal for the players. Uh, they're not going to have, you know, like I said, the OTAs. But I, I again, I think people think a lot of this stuff, a lot of this amazing stuff happens in OTAs. As one coach told me, we're already reintroducing a lot of this stuff back at training camp, you know, like you start, you, you stop. Uh, so really, again, it's just on the players to stay uh, sort of self-engaged, self-aware. And, you know, the, the coaches are going to expect that when they show up to training camp and when training camp happens. And we even asked this today. I don't know if it makes sense for the Cowboys to have training camp in Oxnard. Don't I say that. See, don't say that, I Jane. Could, I live in Cali. Don't say that. Jane. I could legitimate. <laughs> I could legitimately see the Cowboys doing training camp in Frisco this year. Wow. And um, Jane, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit on Dak because you, you, one of your best shows that I listen to on the Boys and Girls podcast and everybody support Jane. Now, if you want to kind of hear clickbait stuff, don't listen to the show because you, you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear where they try to be very careful, very safe, and really try to make sure that it's, it's validated. 
And on December 5th, uh, that was my favorite show, and that was with Charles Robinson. You remember that? Oh, I love Charles. He's great. <laughs> it, yeah, y'all knocked it out the park. The, but the thing that really just kind of stood out to me was obviously you was told about the 40 million and that came out. Uh, but they went into more detail, Charles did, and y'all was discussing it, you and Bob, about the fact that really the 40 million was more so a counter offer is what I was kind of, and it was more so that they felt insulted with 25 million, right? It was, Make it yeah, sure it was, I'm getting it right. yeah, you're right. It was kind of like an F you. Oh, you're not gonna <laughs> pay me this? then this is what we want. But that was a real ask, I was told. And so while his camp has discredited that report from the jump, that's what they asked. Um, right, right. And I truly, then I think the number I, I was told was more than Jared Goff yearly. It's still this year's thing. And look, it's shrewd. It's a shrewd agent. I mean, I would appreciate it if it was my guy. <laughs> um, but they are looking more at a four-year deal so they can come back to the table after Patrick, Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson get paid and reset the market again. Um, so, I mean, you can look at that, you know, multiple ways. Uh, would you rather have a contract and feel safe uh, and have that, that guarantee there? Or do you want to bet on yourself and see what this looks like in four years? I guess my only gamble is Mike McCarthy's high on him now, I'm told. What if Mike McCarthy's not high on him in three or four years? What if, you know, other teams are like, oh, he's not as great as we thought he was. And as a result, you don't get that money. What I'll say on all of that is Dak Prescott believes in himself. Dak is one of those guys that's always bet on himself. And he has played for, I mean, rookie minimums. He didn't get that fat guarantee that you get when you go in the first round and whatnot. Remember, he was a four stringer. He was behind Jamil Showers yeah. on the depth chart. And I just think it's admirable all the things that he's done. I mean, he's done everything the right way. I mean, even with this like debacle about this party at his house, uh, which is such a joke. I've talked to people and <laughs> there there weren't 12 people. It wasn't a rager. Right. You know, as I reported <laughs> The restaurant, and I've been there, I go there probably once a week. Um, it's a big steakhouse here in Dallas. It's where I did the big Des Bryant sit down. He ordered uh, food, and as even Nick and Sam's told me, this wasn't food for 20 people. Um, they threw in extra food because he made the sizable donation to them delivering meals to first responders. That got lost in the TMZ story. Uh, and then the girls there filmed what a birthday setup would look like for when pandemic breaks and for one of the people at the party. They've done a similar setup for me. Now they didn't film it on Zoom, but if anything, Dak Prescott just needs to ask who his friends are because that picture got leaked. Absolutely. Um, right. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. But that was probably the only misstep that mm -hmm. Dak has had. And then of course he got nailed for working out with Dak with Des Bryant. But the kid always does things the right way for you. Uh to me, he's like the golden boy of the franchise. And then you know, he navigated, you know, you lost your starting quarterback to a back injury in Tony Romo. Not only did Romo not get a chance to compete with him, he won the locker room over. Absolutely. You know, Zeke got suspended for six games. What, he won three of those? Yeah. Um, then you had to deal with, you know, navigating the fact that everyone's asking you, where's your best friend? Why is he not at training camp last year? He's in Cabo. He handled that like a champ. And he never let the contract. He could have sat out camp last year. He didn't do that. No, no. Um, so, you know, we've overpaid, you know, some would argue, some would argue, I won't say they did, but some would argue they overpaid Demarcus Lawrence. They paid Jalen Smith. Um, you know, you paid Zeke more than he was asking for two years ahead of his contract being up, but yet you're sort of hemming and hawing on like the most, arguably the most important guy in your building. Yeah, it's kind wow. of crazy. And Jane, you know, just one quick follow-up on that. One of the things you also said was, I think it was March 2nd was that the locker room wants Dak to get paid. I think that yeah. was one of the quotes is just because, you know, when we, we talking to Jane, obviously we, West Coast and I, we have a relationship with players, but it's not going to be to your level, right? But that shocked me. It's like, are you really saying that guys are lobbying? Like, not like obviously out loud, but just as you, with your contacts and sources that they really are hoping for that. Uh, is that, did I hear you right on that? 
they've said it publicly. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott said it on Good Morning Football at the Pro Bowl to us. Demarcus Lawrence has said it. Right. Even Demarcus Lawrence mm -hmm. said, don't ask one man about another man's another money. Another man's money. Because cool. he got paid. <laughs> right. That, but he is so respected by his... I've never seen a player <laughs> that I've ever covered that has been so quickly embraced by... I mean, he won Des Bryant over within the first couple of... Like, I think it was OTAs is when Des told me he knew he was the guy. I mean, this is a better, kind of a salty veteran player. And Des has never, you know, he's always been against the hazing because of the way he was hazed by Roy Williams, uh, you know, not carrying the pads. And he literally said yeah, interesting backstory. He said they actually, Roy actually apologized to that many years later, but he's always been really good with rookies and whatnot. But it was the way Dak just came in and galvanized that team and just the way that like players would tell me that they could be down and out in a game. The knock on Tony Romo for a long time was, how was he going to lose the game in the fourth quarter? And I, I saw this team when they went 13 and three as rookie season, right. they believed they could win no matter what, what the situation was. And even the last couple of years. And so isn't that the type of guy you can't, you can't replace those. And then he had over 4,000 yards throwing. He became yeah. a throwing quarterback for you when you thought that he was only a guy that could, that could uh, run the ball for you. That was more of, you know, more of the Mississippi state guy that we were used to. So I'm like, what what other boxes are you guys looking to check? I don't I don't really get it. Yeah, you brought up you brought up Dez. Before we let you out of here, man, I gotta ask you about two kind of Texas boys that are trying to, you know, whether it be I know one for sure wanna come home, but you know, one is said in the media and his team, you know, the, I'm talking about Jamal Adams and one Dez Bryant. I mean, if I'm a betting man, what are the chances that we get two of them, two of them former Texas boys to come home or 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 is it is this a 50 50 shot or what are you because i mean jerry jones when he spoke today about you know about uh about jamal adams he was very candid and very you know I'm, I'm always hesitant when jerry jones is very direct because it lets me know is he trying to send me a message or is he trying to send the jets message because like it kind of sounded like he was like definitely out with trading for jamal but at the same time i feel like um, you know, was it kind of posturing? But more importantly, what are you, what are your thoughts on a possible, you know, of, of Jamal Adams or Dez Bryant coming to Dallas next year or this year, 2020? Jamal Adams to me is your Earl Thomas. Uh, I once joked on NFL Network that if I had a dollar for every Earl Thomas rumor that I ran down, I'd be retired in the British Virgin Islands, which is my end game. <laughs> she's, she's already planned. She's already thought about this. It's just... <laughs> It's not happening. For I, one second for I, views. I, I would be very surprised. Go Sean Payton there too. <laughs> yeah. I would be very surprised. Look, they've made plays before, right? They went after Sean Payton. I told you guys that uh, last offseason. They went after Jamal Adams. I reported that. I told you guys, like, they made a robust offer for him and it wasn't enough. Why is that going to excite them now? Uh, it sounds like that relationship with the Jets has gotten so contentious. Maybe they're just going to wait to see if the Jets just let him go. People forget that if you're going to give up something for a veteran player like him, but like Earl Thomas, you also have to sign them yeah. to a contract worthy of a player like them. You're trying to get Dak Prescott signed and you're telling me, hey, Dak, I'm not going to give you a contract extension, but I'm going to go sign this guy over here. I already gave Amari Cooper a bunch of money and... You know, I got Demarcus Lawrence done, but you're still like, we'll figure you out at some point. I just don't see it happening. And I was told by a source that I completely trust, they said it's not top of mind. So I know that I upset some people out there that really got excited <laughs> about the Jamal Adams stuff. I can only tell you what I know. And to your point, I feel like Jerry was far more direct about addressing that, what I will call a rumor, than he has been about rumors in the past. Yeah. What about and Des? Des. There is a very real interest in Des. I know the Cowboys have talked to Des. Um, I think Des makes sense when you consider the the challenges of these medicals that teams are going to have when they're trying to figure out where a player's at um, in free agency when they go after a veteran. At least this is a devil that you know. He's been working out next to the facility. People know him, and if I know Des, he'll find a way to get his medicals. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like he makes sense. And I don't think he's going to be a locker room cancer as some people use that narrative. 
I've seen him work out with guys like Corey Coleman and Lil Jordan Humphrey and saw the way that he was coaching them up. I saw him when he was in New Orleans with Michael Thomas and Mark Ingram and Cam Jordan and how much that locker room embraced him after just two days. The guy loves football. And I actually think a no-nonsense coach like Mike McCarthy is good for him. I mean, think what Mike <laughs> Gundy did for Dez mm -hmm. at Oklahoma State. So I've always argued that Dez was coddled a little bit through no fault of Jason's, really. Uh, he was, Jerry had a sweet spot for him. And Dez, and I saw it, Dez would very easily go to the principal's office and go over the teacher's head when he didn't like something. Mike's doing things differently around this. Even today, there's a moment I kind of laughed. Jerry went to, to uh, answer a question. Mike's like, I got that. And I was like, uh oh. oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, hmm. just like he's, he's sort of forced me to get on my a game as a reporter. I think he's going to force his players to do the same. And I think that's a good thing for Dallas. So hmm. as for Des, I have talked to at least two other teams that are intrigued. I think for other teams, this medical situation could hurt Des. I think for the Cowboys, it could help Des. So we'll see. Hmm. My last question before we let you out of here, because I know you got some hot pockets for some in the stove, because it's ten it's ten o'clock. It's actually there. lean cuisine. I have not had my meal today, but lean cuisine <laughs> is sitting on my countertop. <laughs> my last my last question. Microwave. Like we I have it's a so unhealthy. I have a I have a I have a uncanny my, my pastor always says whenever the Lord says some a bunch of times in the scripture, it means he's he's saying it for a reason. And the word that 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 Jerry kept on saying in this interview more than anything was trade this, trade that, trade, 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 trade. Trade, trade, yeah, trade, 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 trade. So I wanted to know, for your, <laughs> for, I'm, I want to know, would you, are you willing to put your stimulus check on the fact that we <laughs> will stay at 17? I want to know. That's a good question. Uh, I'm with you on that. I thought it was interesting that he even offered up that in his mock draft, they had a glitch <laughs> during a trade. I'm like, Jerry, what are you doing here? Give it away, Jerry. <laughs> uh, That's why I the goat. Right. I have heard there is a very real scenario where Cesar Ruiz is a Michigan offensive lineman they like, and he would be a guy that would address their need at center. Now, they do have Joe Looney. I thought Joe Looney did a really nice job when Frederick was out with the autoimmune disease. I don't know if I buy Connor McGovern or Connor Williams filling in at center. So I think Cesar Ruiz is interesting. Uh, but I also know that they've been talking to a lot of corners. They've got to address the corner position, you know, with Byron Jones gone. Uh, as I've, I've been reporting this week, I I've been told that CJ Henderson out of Florida is a guy to keep an eye on and Clemson's AJ Terrell. Uh, like I said, linebacker, I think they really like Chase on. I think if he's on the board at 17, he's going to be hard to pass. But if Chase on's off the board and then, a, you know, I know another guy they've looked at linebacker, Kenneth Murray, um, so it's kind of hard to say what they're going to do. I could see them possibly trading back and getting a pick, like I said, if they could get Cesar Ruiz and, and that made sense for them. But yeah, I, I never know a Jerry sometimes. Sometimes I feel like he throws that stuff off to create some headlines. Tough to say. Yeah, because a lot of teams, I have like three or four teams that I've written down that have had some type of rumor to them moving around. And I just feel like this is like, I don't know, maybe it's because of the, because of the pandemic or whatever it is, but for whatever reason, there's a gonna, I feel like there's going to be a lot of movement in this draft, whether it be up or down or just, you know, because you had the Miami talking about possibly, I'm like, Miami already got enough picks, but they want more picks for. And they, they even them, they have been rumored to. So it's like, if this is a draft, like my boy Boss Cowboy said, oddly enough, if this is a draft that you would if you see that somebody is worth going up this would probably be one of the cheaper times to actually go up in the draft and i know most of people are saying that trade back trade back trade back but me and boss we were looking at the uh the, you know the little spreadsheet that jimmy johnson created as far as like you yeah, can you know just like the tackles a lot the, you know determine and like one thing i see a lot is for whatever reasons a lot of tackles you know says a lot of tackles are gonna come off Quality this board tackle grab. yeah and, I Go think ahead. what a lot of coaches are telling me too is they, there's a lot of depth. So like I kind of laughed at everyone that was mocking the Cowboys and even the Saints taking wide receivers in the first round with their first pick. I'm like, okay, let's talk about the Saints situation. The Saints found Michael Thomas in the second round and they've just got Emmanuel Sanders. Why? And they've got Traquan Smith and Lil Jordan Humphrey. I would bet my stimulus check if I was getting one on 1000% that the Saints are not taking a wide receiver at 24, put money on that. Um, okay. As for the Cowboys, 
CD Lamb is sure intriguing, but you don't like what you're getting from Michael Gallup and Amari Cooper. And then essentially you just need to go find a third guy. I, I don't know. It's a lot of money for a third. And, right. And they're going to use Blake Jarwin more. So, I mean, you've got, a, a, you know, you're tight in there. Yeah. I, I Like I said, CD Lamb is very intriguing. And if he's there, I think the Cowboys have a hard time not taking him. I don't expect CD Lamb to be there at 17. I don't expect the Cowboys to pick a wide receiver because this is supposed to be such a deep draft for wide receivers. So, I mean, look, as reporters, these mock drafts always crack me up because we're pretending that we know more than people who have literally been evaluating players, scouts for like multiple years, uh, coaches and GMs who literally have interviewed these prospects, know exactly how it fits into the system and the plans. And you've got us like Jack holes on the outside are like, here's what I'm going to tell you. So-and-so is picking. <laughs> it always feels like I'm always, I always kind of laugh. It's like someone telling me like they know how to do my job, but I, I just base it on the conversations I've had with people. And then you have to literally also sort of juxtapose that against sometimes agents want the Cowboys name in the mix because it now all of a sudden makes their player look more intriguing. Like if Sean Payton's talking about a quarterback or a wide receiver, the way he, he was talking Lamar Jackson, everyone wanted Lamar Jackson. As soon as Sean started talking yep. Lamar, um, you know, if the Patriots are, are God forbid talking to a guy, everybody wants who the Patriots are talking about. I feel sometimes there's a little bit of, of smoke out there by throwing the fact that the Cowboys are into a guy uh, and that's why I ran down that Cesar Ruiz rumor because I was like, come on, I don't know about this. I've gotten some mixed messages. I got enough people telling me that there was a little momentum to that one. Absolutely. Dane, the last thing I'm going to ask you before you get out of here, I absolutely promise, man, is there is this big optimism. Like there's this big cloud of optimism over the Dallas Cowboys. And for the first time, it's in a positive way. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like, I know they say this, Jane, but this year we really go into the Super Bowl. All the other years <laughs> didn't count. <laughs> like, I like, this is like, I really feel it. You know what I'm saying? And I want to know just from, is there a different sense of optimism with Coach McCarthy in this building that you've seen versus other years? Just to kind of let us up out of here before we, so we can go to bed and go to sleep. And, and West Coast, you're not going to be able to sneak in like the last two quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think if there wasn't a pandemic, yes. And I say that because I think it's just, I don't think you can undervalue the importance of building team camaraderie. There's a lot of new faces, not only in the coaching staff, but on that roster. Uh, there's not as many veterans as you don't have the Jason Wittens this year. And we saw what that did when he wasn't here two years ago. You don't have Randall Cobb that I thought was undervalued for his leadership uh, at the wide receiver position it's going to be different and they're going to be adapting to a new offense and defense and new leadership that they're not going to have much time to gel with face to face to start the season. So I think that's real. I actually think this pan is going to benefit teams like the saints who, when I'm, and again, I'm talking about the NFC who already have a system in place, a quarterback that is so based on routine, who Sean will often talk about the fact that they complete each other's sentences. You saw how close the Saints have gotten the last two years. You think Sean's going to let that happen a third year? Uh, and now, by the way, the news that Tom Brady, Gronk, Mike Evans are all assembling uh, Steph Curry, Golden State Warriors <laughs> in the NFC South. I think all of a sudden this thing got a little bit scary. Um, do I think that this team is capable of winning a Super Bowl in the next three years? Absolutely. I think Mike McCarthy is the sort of stabilizing force that they've need that they've needed. Uh, I think you've got a lot of the right talent on this roster and they've locked up a lot of those guys in the long term. I think Dak Prescott's the guy that's going to win you a Super Bowl. I just don't know if given the circumstances this year and some of the unique challenges that it presents, if this is necessarily Dallas's year. Shoot, man, I I appreciate that. One thing, <laughs> one thing, because Wes is going to say another thing. He's like, all right, one more. <laughs> one more. No, anyway, I read one of your tweets, and one of my favorite tweets is a memory tweet of yours, where you said, I started off the decade just begging for a full-time job as a news reporter in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I was ecstatic to just fill in on CBS as a reporter and morning traffic reporter, anchor in a freelance role, nobody, I wanna say that again, 
Nobody saw me doing sports early on, so I abandoned it at 24 only to come back. Now, we love to talk football. You know, that's what we do. We love the Cowboys. But what I want to hear is how in the world the person that we both admire, like we see you like I would believe you see Colin Cowherd. You know, like to see somebody that's reached a pinnacle uh, and a voice for the America's team. I just want to kind of hear your personal story, if that's okay, because I might not ever meet you again. So I just want to hear your personal story of your, just the rise and almost seeing a dream deterred, but coming back around to it. Marcus, you're so sweet to have that resonate with you because, you know, I've been doing some of these Zoom classrooms with future journalists because I know that this economy is going to be rough. I, I think our business is going to look different on the other side, uh, just because I've been through crappy economies as a journalist. Um, but I've talked about the importance of knowing your why in the business. I think a lot of people look up and see the Stephen A's, the Colin Cowers, the Aaron Andrews, and their initial instinct is, I just want to be on TV. In other words, this is an entertainment business. And there's an aesthetic aspect to what we do, and there's an entertainment aspect of it as well. But my why is I love to tell stories. And when I went off to college, I wanted to be the next Lara Logan who, you know, was covering the Taliban. And I just was like, wow, she's embedded with the Taliban. Like this beautiful blonde South African, how the hell did she do that? And Christiane wow. Amanpour, who was, you know, covering the Iraq war. So I went to college, I double majored in politics. And I thought that that was where my career was gonna take me. But I started, uh, I, I was friends with a lot of the players at Texas. And there was a guy named Bill Little who used to write these amazing pieces that felt like he was taking you inside the ballpark when they were going to the College World Series. And I sort of loved covering the triumphs of players. But, you know, when I got into this business back in 2003, there were a couple of women that were doing it. I mean, I looked at Miss Melissa Stark, the Bonnie Bernsteins, Andrea Kramers, Alex Flanagan. But it wasn't a there certainly weren't any women that were NFL insiders. And so, you know, we sort of talk about you you kind of, when you're young, look to people who look like you as like, that's what I can do because a person that looks like me did it. I didn't see a lot of women that were insiders. And so my career path was like, well, maybe I want to be an Aaron Andrews or a Melissa Stark. And then when I went off to my first TV markets, because I wasn't good when I started, they didn't think that a woman could carry a 50 pound camera and shoot sports and follow the ball, edit her own highlights and do a Sunday sports show. And admittedly, I wasn't great at it back then. But I think going and being a news reporter for as long as I did, I learned how to really tell stories, cut through the crap, uh, differentiate a headline, you know, from a storyline. Um, and I, like, I am so proud of that journey and 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 where I went because I covered news long enough that I didn't love reporting on uh, people's worst moments. I really wanted to get back to sports and talk about people's best moments because even if a player mm -hmm. loses a game is with a team where people don't believe in him there's a comeback story and we celebrate yep. those people you know and and the ones that don't succeed they're a cautionary tale mm -hmm. and so there was just this aspect of sports that i just i really appreciated it but i think it was because i didn't get the jobs early on i have an empathy for the underdog and i also feel like my job really taught me how to develop relationships and i think that's why i've had some success and this business and i'm really excited that even just as women you know men are beginning to take us a little bit more seriously and i'm talking about coaches the fans the players we're doing an entire twitch show tomorrow cynthia freeland who did analytics at espn now with us um she's assembled 32 of the league's best reporters and we're doing an all-female draft show wow. that was unheard wow. of when i started in 2003 but I mean, we've got Alex Flanagan, uh, we've got Hannah Storm, we've got Diana Rossini, myself, all these women that are, I consider really smart in the business. All, uh, Kim Jones, Aditi Kikubala, go down the list. We're all doing this show. Kimberly Martin, like keep going down. Pretty much any woman you know doing sports right now is gonna be doing this Twitch show tomorrow. Just a full female. And it's so great right now because we're even finding, and I'm sure you guys are finding, you know, I didn't, we signed up to do one podcast a month in the off season. We've done mm -hmm. three and had a quarter of a million downloads and listens on just the Cowboys. Wow. You know, when you look at MJ's uh, story on ESPN, 6.8 million viewers, people are so hungry for content. And so we may have not been interesting to the sports fan if 
we had traditional TV and sort of the influx of sports because there's none of that going on. Now more than ever, we have this real opportunity to not only show the male sports fan what women are capable in this business, but we might actually have a captive audience just because they're looking for content right now. So it's kind of, it's fortuitous. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and sh man, I seen your hustle and I seen your grind, man. Like at them training camps, there is a whole lot of standing around in that heat waiting for people to come off the field. And Jane is always out there, man. And I just see, I mean, one of the things that I, I absolutely love about your your story, man, is just, it's kind of, it, I mean, it just reminds me of, you know, the, the story of my mother and uh, other ladies that have just persevered. And like the strongest person that I've ever come across is my mother who brought us out here from, from the South, out here on her own to do our own thing. And it's like, you know, I remember my mom told me, like, you can be everywhere you want to be, but you're going to be a cowboy fan. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, like she literally, like she literally let me pick whatever NBA team. Like she wasn't tripping. Like she's a Spurs fan. I'm a Laker fan. But you're gonna be a Cowboy fan. And so it's like, and and it and it, and it, and it, I say this to say that it's like, you know, one of the biggest joys I think I have now is sitting down with my mom and and her asking me about football. So it's like the circle around. So it's like there is something. There is something very very powerful about a woman who knows her her football. Is it? <laughs> Is, 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 is something, it is something powerful. <laughs> but I, I always keep it real. I, you know, I grew up in a house where CNN was on far more than uh, football. In fact, we had a bird. We called him Scud because we watched so much of the Gulf War crisis that my bird made the Scud missile alarm sound. It's kind of ridiculous. Wow. And my brother didn't play football. He was into arts. And so when I had a radio show in Dallas, like probably the first time I ever got a job just strictly because I was female and I knew it. I'll never forget the biggest slip up. I probably couldn't have even told you who made up the secondary or um, what an edge rusher did or what a 4 3 3 4 defense was. And I looked down at the depth chart and I was like, and this offensive linebacker, oh my God, when I think back. <laughs> and my co host kind of caught me. Thank God, Mark Elfenbein. Uh, I actually, this is on my desk. It's called June 4th, A New Start to a Better Life. And that's. Wow means a lot to me because back in 2012, I was so green at this thing. And here we are in 2020 and, and to your point, it feels really cool to not have people like myself as guests on the show. You know, I became a guest. And so, yes. I, and even just to you guys, that's why, you know, I really try to do as many of these shows as possible. I remember what it was like to get people to, you know, buy into you and establish credibility and, and book host. And so like, I respect the hustle. I love what you guys do. And I think, you know, there's, you know, even for you guys, there's such an opportunity for you guys, no matter where you are at in your life, professionally or personally, and, and, and what your life situation is. If you want this stuff, you know, hard enough, look at the Kurt Warners of the world. He was, yeah. you know, st stuck in shelves at a, a grocery store and then went on to win a Super Bowl. You know, you can sort of rewrite your story at any point. And at 30, 32, I rewrote my story, which was a pivot to sports. So. I certainly wow. encourage you guys to do the same. Shoot, I so, appreciate Jane, you. I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to be Kurt Warner. <laughs> I love that. Now, listen, it's, it, it, oh, it's, it's more. First, we know you like golf, so we go get you on the golf course. <laughs> I'm not that. gonna take it easy on you at all, okay? I the only thing, that. the only thing I'm gonna say, one thing I will say about Jane is I'm, I'm a very, very, I love my wife and I'm very faithful. But I will tell you this, Jane, you've taught me, don't use Fitbits. I heard That's this story. True. Like uh, I'm gonna tell y'all right now, you know what I'm saying, don't get a Fitbit. You know what I'm saying? Because at 4 a.m., if you're supposed to be at the house, you had better be at the house. <laughs> so funny story before I let you go. Michael Bennett, I, I loved him. He was such an enigmatic, enigmatic character in the locker room last year. You know, so many people were up in arms. He's gonna, sit, he's not gonna, you know, toe the line. He's not gonna, he's not gonna follow the rules. Well, yes. he never did. In fact, if you watch, go back and watch the Cowboys games that are are, are playing. I don't know if they probably didn't show it. He would literally walk behind the bench, drink Gatorade, and just all of us reporters would sort of laugh. Like, well, he's not toe the line. You're like, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but after the Fitbit thing happened, I was I kind of laughed at how many people reached out to me. I was like, did you make that up? And I'm like, come on. Like, my job as a journalist <laughs> is to tell is to tell stories rooted in fact. Why would I make that up? Not only that, I would look like a chump saying yeah. like a guy cheated on me and and again like the spirit of it was me responding to a charlie robinson and albert Breer tweet about the pelotons 
right. it 1000% happened. In fact, his, the woman he ended up marrying was pregnant here recently and reached out when all that happened and said that her husband was the subject of a gossip tweet. And I was like, well, <laughs> first of all, the power of Jane Slater. <laughs> first of all, how did you know he was the subject of said tweet? Because I never mentioned his name, name. Or, the, or the period. There was a reason he told you it was to get out in front of it. Uh, but it is what it is. Yeah. But Michael Bennett, when I walked into the locker room, he hadn't said much to me. And he goes, yo, that really happened to you? <laughs> I was like, bro, I'll tell you the story behind it if you can explain to me what's going on in defense this year. He's like, nah, but did that really happen to you? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because you gotta, because I'm, because I mean, for, for us, for us, and for you know, that's that's we call that's that's nuts. You know what I'm saying? Like that's yeah. a normal person. You're like normal person shouldn't be getting caught up like that. But I'm like, you know, but when I see it, I'm like, that that sounds like Jane Slater. That sounds like you know, if somebody's gonna catch you at four o'clock in the morning from your Fitbit, I think it's Jane Slater because she be the, getting to the truth. <laughs> the, the funny part about this is, even though I'm a reporter, I, I do feel like I've been cheated on more than most because I don't want to know. In other words, if you go looking, you're going to find. Right. And I'm never that girl that's wanted a guy's uh, password. I've never wanted to. I, I just don't want to know. It Maybe I've got, I'm exploring that in isolation right now, guys, uh, just to just TMI here, but <laughs> for any for um, future dates, just let what you know. <laughs> was crazy about that was I never, I not, never even thought that it was a tracking device. Um, but an alert went off kind of like, you know, a motion that there was activity by partner that wanted to sync with me and got me this Christmas gift. And lo and behold, you know, you can't really explain that away. I mean, he had told <laughs> me that he was at a, uh, women's club uh late at night was embarrassed to share that with me and i was like come on man you know i'm not weird about that stuff like i'd rather you do that than go get bottle service because we know that something can happen at the club with bottle service I, come on it's just yeah. the story didn't add up and them dallas clubs they got strippers falling from the from the pole and everything <laughs> who knows what happens in dallas only in dallas do strippers fall from poles i just i don't know it just don't it only happens in dallas <laughs> If his heart rate was spiking that much from just out walking and sitting down, then maybe I dodged a bullet. I would have been an uh, I would have been an early widow. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the backstory on that. Once you start investing, so you can't and, turn it off. And and I I'm sorry, West Coast. You was finna say. Getting oh no, I'm I'm good, man. I'm just man. I'm just you know, I, man. The comment box is going crazy. I appreciate you, Jane, for stopping by. Man, I ain't gonna lie. When after that interview that you have today with with Jerry Jones, with Jerry Jones, I literally Love told it. I literally told producer my producer Gina. I said, man, I'm gonna be honest with you. After that, I know she's gonna be late because there is some drama from that in from that from that interview. And, and I cut honestly, out those slips. There's no, honestly, there's not. I followed up with some folks. Uh, there's not any drama. Here's what I here's what I'll say. I like Mike McCarthy. I love that he's got me stepping my game up a little bit. I feel like I'm getting back to those journalism basics. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, <laughs> I don't. You know when you when, were super you gonna, nice. We're gonna be super, super nice. accurate now. Just know that. And, Mike. and, and the thing <laughs> that I like that you said when you said I can't see you, so I'm making sure you know I'm not being contentious. Right. You know, like. It, like like when we watch you work and we see the fact that you, we call you the last of the Mohicans to be honest. <laughs> like, like, because you don't see too many journalists. Most journalists today are trying to do clickbaits and journalism, right? Versus you, you seem to have an integrity where you want to stick with the truth. And like you said, encouragement that doesn't just tear players down, but that also brings them up. Yeah. So just just watching you work to me in West Coast is a privilege and so That's thankful true. that you, you you remembered your path <laughs> and didn't think about other people that's trying to be with you on the path. So yeah. Well, I appreciate thing, it. Yeah. Like I said, no drama in Dallas. I you got you I don't take this personal, but it's so funny. Some people like there was a situation a couple years ago, Des Bryant, I asked him about his uh wide receiver numbers and he just like lost his mind on me in the locker room and this one reporter's like well, what are we going to do about this and I was like nothing it's yeah I asked this man why he sucked like of course I'm going to get that response right I just think some people need to understand put yourself in the person you're interviewing shoes like as I tell my journalism students that I've talked to recently like guys I just met you Marcus can I ask you how much money you're making a year like what your credit score is and do you like your boss I just met you. You're not going to tell me that right. stuff. Yeah, like exactly. there is, 
there is a finesse to what we do. And right. if I ask something that doesn't make sense or rub somebody the wrong way, like I've got to ask myself, did I ask that question the right way? Right. Yeah, that's a good point, man. I I I let you yeah. I make <laughs> Better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and, and that's a and that's a true point, man. My mom always tells me, like, you know, and I always say this too, like, especially when I meet people who are, you know, who are who are definitely at that pinnacle where I'm trying to get to, is like she she always told me, be mindful of people who are above you, who who are able to do things for you knowing that you're not able to necessarily return a favor to you in that same magnitude basically meaning like it says something special about people who are up here who are able to still look down and still be able to to, to assist because you know at the end of the day i'm hoping that this podcast you know bring you a couple more subscribers but you know i think it says a lot about yourself you know what i'm saying that you're able to you necessarily help two guys that necessarily you know at this point of our career can't really you know boost you Kurt up Warmer. but i promise you you know exactly man kurt Warmer, he he had a beard he had gray hair but he still got the ring that's the only thing that matters that's right <laughs> anytime nice. you need right me, next I to jane working i love y'all's hustle anytime you guys need me happy to help out uh if if work doesn't get in the way and uh if we are in oxnard i'll see you guys out there again huh absolutely and, and i'm really praying, gonna we're praying for that too. See, Jane, you can't show me that you play golf. That's going to be an excuse for us to play. I'm telling you, you that's how we all relax. We're going to do it. I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much for having me on. Thank and like you. I said, let's do this again. Absolutely. You have a blessed absolutely. day. Absolutely. Thank you, Jane. So, man, H, that was absolutely an absolute. I'm about to go run in the street with my shirt off. I'll be back. <laughs> What's the, what's nah, the play, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm about to go run in the, nah, I'm about to go run in the street with my shirt off. It, it confirms you know everything that we've always said about Jane. She's a scout, bro. Let's just be real, bro. She's yeah, one she's of us. She's one of us. Fan. Just say it, bro. Cover truth. Just say she it, bro. Also, she's one of us, bro. She's one of us. And she's one of us, bro. <laughs> I would say better. You know, I mean, just, of course she's better because she's edgy, but I'm saying her I'm mindset, just, I, her, know, her thought, I, she's one of us, bro. She's in the Rebel Nation, bro. You know, she's somebody that we, she's Rebel we Nation. reference her because she's the person that's going to be, to me, the most honest. Like, one of the things that I love and, like, me and you've been following her strongly since was when everybody was basically calling Dez the cancer, and she talked about it again today. She was one of the only few reporters that said, just like she said today, it was zero infighting in that line. Zero. Zero. So, so Something else she said that that was dope, like too. Hey, it, scouts. Even, even bigger. Even bigger. I don't care about that. I don't care about that. You know what she said that was even bigger? She said, Dez fell in love with Dak at OTAs. Yes. So all that, oh, Dez and Dak. No, I don't want to hear it. Right. Like, there's a reason why Dak said, Dez said, this is the thing. This is one thing I love about Dez. Dez is not afraid to tell the truth. If Dez said everybody else's breath stank, why wouldn't he say that guy's breath stank too? There's a reason why Dez never said anything publicly against Dak Prescott is because he had nothing to say against. He had no problem with him. He had no problem with him. He had no problem with Zeke. He had no problem with him. You know what I'm saying? I absolutely love this show, man. Hey, I'm to break this thing go, down I'm before just, we get up out of here, man. You've been preaching at me to take off my shade. So since since you know the interview is over, I'm for my boy Jalen. We rocking to clear our views on the way out the door. Um, I have nothing else to say unless my boy West Coast does. Nah, I'm good, man. I know. Man, I, hey, I, recap, I would say this. We though. gotta I would recap say this, that, though. though, bro. Like we have to recap what oh, we. Oh yeah, are. we gonna recap this. I'm gonna break this whole thing. I'm gonna break this thing whole down, man. I'm and I'm talking about it. even do a show with it. I know. Oh you're yeah, with tomorrow. It, you know? Tomorrow. Just, it. But hey, it man, was but just I, so meaty, bro. Like it was so much quality info that she unleashed. Yeah. I really just hope that you know we all appreciate that because. If you're a serious Cowboy fan out to uncover truth, you got it today. You yep. know there's no drama with Dez. You know now that they talk to Dez. Yep. Okay, you know that now. Yep. So, you know, it's things that came out that she privileged. She kicked her feet up and she talked like she was just relaxed and told us a lot of good quality info on just love. You know, yeah. it was just love. And the main thing I respect about Jane is like, and, and Cowboy tweet. think he got a shot too. Let's just all be real. I'm reading the comments. I know he do. He think he got a shot. Yeah, yeah, like, what? That's Boss Cowboy. Well, yeah, man. You know, you, you know me and I was smooth. I can't hear you, man. You, you sound like Boss Cowboy. We, we, hey, Boss yeah. Cowboy was smooth. He, you know, I, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying no, 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 no. But like, <laughs> it's the 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 is 
is you got so much like truth today. And it's, it's one of those things that make it rewarding and that I feel so privileged to do this, man, to where we get a chance to enlighten uh, people about the team we all love, man. And then, you know, to just have just, you know, people like Jane and yeah. obviously Jalen supporting us now yeah. and Chris Harris came on the show and yep. Kyle Duggard and, you know, obviously. Hey, and you know something? Fall out. And you know something, boss, too? But he's going to come back. Um, you know, we possibly have a ex quarterback tomorrow. Chris Carter. Well, yeah, he, he Chris, nah, that, you know, Quincy yeah. Carter tomorrow. And it's, we're not bragging, but it's just a privilege. It's a real privilege to really be able to do what we do. And so that when we all win this Super Bowl, and I'm with you, West Coast, you know, like, now, all of us are going to have that much more excitement because we're all invested. You know, yeah. I'm talking about all of us. People and also, invested. before we get up out of here. The in, the super chats, the people that just give good comments, the people that debate, the people that hate on us, the people that hate on the Cowboys, the people that love the Cowboys. We love all y'all. Invested. We need all y'all, too. And the last thing I'm going to say, too, man, is also, man, I should also... There's about 100, there's still about 140 people on here, man. I need you guys to go look at yourselves in the mirror real quick and really tell yourself that these random, these random cowboy fans on the on 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 the internet talking that cowboy talk are pretty damn close to the people. I mean the information. I don't care about I mean the people is love. I love the people. But what I'm saying is, but what I'm saying is a lot of what Jane was talking about was reaffirmation of what we've already been telling you guys. And that's why I think it was just so beautiful. Like a lot of this conversation, like a lot of this conversation was literally just her reaffirming stuff that we've already told you guys. But she made it sound so much better. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you already know what it is, man. G, hit the lights. We up out of here. Never look down because the door is open. Wait, Jeez. come out. Never look down because the star is open. Hey. Hold up. Never look down because the star is up. Peace. Peace. We up out of here. <laughs>